how I first introduced the Cradle Mountain to the public. And I remember my first climbing of Frenchman's Cap with, with Jack Thwaites for a mate. And uh, uh, the mountains of the uh, southwest, I climbed them one after another. And uh, I've been gratified to know that my footsteps have been followed uh, by many uh, visitors who were equipped uh, as walkers. <laughs> When you first started a walking club, how did you actually go about it? Uh, it was this way. I had been sent to Melbourne to start the tourist business. And I, opened the, I uh, inaugurated all the offices, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, uh, Adelaide. And when I came back to Tasmania and had to talk about it, I asked myself the question, why do people come here? I thought, well, first of all, the, there's the crowd who come on account of the climate. It's too hot for them up in northern Queensland or away in the west, and they come for that and so on. But some, I thought, they come to see the natural beauties of the island, and uh, uh, included in those would be members of the mainland walking clubs. So I went round the walking clubs and talked to them. I remember particularly uh, talking to the bushwalkers in Sydney. And uh, uh, I, I, a year or two later, I was back there on, uh, on other business, but they were having a dance, and I thought I'd better go along to the dance, so I did. And the chairman came to me and he said, Mr. Emmett, since your talk here, it's become the ambition of every new entrant to the Bushwalkers Club of Sydney, it has become his ambition to go to Tasmania and to do the walk from Cradle Mountain to Lake St. Clair. When you had the idea of forming a walking club, was it to encourage Tasmanians to see the uh, countryside here, or was it to encourage mainlanders to come over? The idea of forming a walking club was to get together a band of people that knew the back blocks and the uh, more difficult places of access uh, well, so as to be able to help visiting bushwalkers uh, whom I expected to come over in hundreds. Mr. Emmett, how did you go about publicising Tasmania's tourist attractions outside the state? The first thing was to form a debating club locally and learn to face an audience on a platform. And after I'd done that, I went to the mainland and, and took lantern slides and t talked Tasmania uh, in every state uh, from uh, Western Australia right up to Queensland. I remember earlier you were telling me about an incident in Geelong. Yes, amongst other places. Uh, well, the, the story begins uh, when I came back to Tasmania, having done my most of my work on the mainland, came back to Tasmania. But while I was in Melbourne the last few days, the Victorian uh, Education Department had arranged a series of lantern lectures on all the different states, and I was asked to give the one on Tasmania. For that purpose, they had engaged the big theatre at Geelong. So I, after consultation with my wife in Hobart, I said I thought it was uh, important enough for me to go back specially, which I did. I remember in the old ship, the Lungana and uh, we, we, I went down to Geelong, and uh, when the evening came, I went along to the theatre, and I found that the time it was ready to show the first slides that the theatre was crammed to the roof and they were carrying in seats. I asked the caretaker what size the uh, audience was, and he said, oh, well, there's over a couple of thousand this theatre holds. So afterwards, I went to my hotel, and there was a gentleman having a drink at the bar. The barman introduced us. And I, I knew him then by repute. And I said to him, I notice that you're, you have advertised a concert for tonight. I saw your posters all over the town in Geelong. I hope you had a successful evening. 
I didn't, he said. Some coot from Tasmania was over here with a back of the lantern slides, and they tell me that he had the theatre packed to the roof. There were about eight turned up for my concert, he said, and so I cancelled it. The barman introduced us. The man's name was Peter Dawson, well known in, with the, for his uh, baritone voice and the uh, records that were made and sold of uh, his work. Mr Emmett, many of Tasmania's national parks are accessible by road, but it's still necessary for people to walk to really see what they have to offer. Do you think they should be made even more accessible with roads to reach the more remote areas rather than the present walking tracks? I regret that that is a very difficult question to answer. There is so much for and against. I have been to other states where it has been quite easy to, to get to these places uh, by car and you'll find uh, parties of drinkers going out uh, Sunday after Sunday and you're getting exactly the, the wrong sort of people if it's too easy of access. Mr. Evans, you conducted quite a number of the trips through the national parks yourself, didn't you? Yes. Do you remember one in particular, the one shot by Fred Smithies at Christmas in 1933? I would have a difficulty in recalling all the occasions on which I have been out with Fred Smithies. I've seen him stand on precipices and take photographs in places that I wouldn't have dared to crawl to myself. He's the most intrepid explorer I've known in my experience. Well, we've been able to obtain a copy of the original film that Fred Smith is shot while walking through the Cradle Mountain Lake St. Clair Reserve. Would you like to see it? I would indeed. Right. You're lucky. Let's go. What was your normal method of transport up through to Cradle Mountain from Wilmot? Uh, <coughs> horseback and uh, horseback and uh, buggies. Bob Quail was the driver, I remember. From Wilmot to Cradle Valley, or Malden. What time in the morning would you start out? Oh, just after breakfast. About nine o'clock. What was the significance of that caption? We had those uh, little revivers, of course, every hour or so. Daisy Dell in those days, was that quite a large sawmilling centre? Uh, yes. Uh, there was considerable traffic and sometimes uh, the bullock wagons uh, interfered with the roads very much. What would be the average size of some of the parties you led through there? Uh, well, it all depends where they were going to. If they were going right through, uh, uh, there'd be about ten, I suppose, the average size. Were you ever held up by the Pensapine River in flood? Uh, no, never. We did st strike a few wet periods, but uh, nothing to grumble at very much. on the backs of the party there seem to be pretty bulky looking. Did you travel light or did you have to carry a lot of heavy equipment? No, we, uh, we travelled uh, light. Some carried more than others, of course. The 
conditions look pretty cold up there. Uh, very. I, I have known it snow every day for the uh, trip through from uh, Cradle Mountain right through to uh, St. Clair. How did some of the women take these conditions in those days? Oh, they were generally well equipped and uh, uh, there was no trouble. Uh, I remember on one occasion we met a party of women coming the opposite way and we met them when we got near to Lake St. Clair and some of my party took their shoes off and gave them to the uh, new party say, telling them that in the flimsy things that they had on themselves that never get through. I think someone in this party seems to have an umbrella. Surely rather a strange piece of equipment to be carrying in the mountains. Yes, it must be uh, the Chief Justice... Uh, what was his name? Griffiths. Because I remember his daughter Megan Griffiths was on one of the trips. What sort of facilities would you have had in some of the huts in the reserve then? There were just tables and uh, rough chairs and uh, good fireplaces. But we were all was sure of being able to make a big fire and uh, you soon got any wet things dried. It seems that uh, walkers haven't changed. They still have their spell-ups every couple of hours or so. Oh, yes. It becomes very necessary at times. It's quite possible to overdo it and get left. This is a very old film and it takes my memory back. Have had any opportunity to move off the main track and climb some of the mountains along the way through to Lake St. Clair from Cradle Mountain? Oh yes, now and again there was time. How many days were you actually on the track? Generally about four. And the record really hasn't been bettered much since then, has it? Uh, no. Oh well, the distance remains the same and You've got to slog it through. I'd better tell you about Megan Griffiths because she'd very likely see this herself. We were walking off from one of the huts and after we got down to the bottom of the hill, she suddenly said, oh, I've, I've left my cape behind. So uh, I said, I'll go back with you and we'll get it. So we went back to the hut, couldn't see it anywhere and she'd got it on all the time. The thing around her neck that she was wanting, she'd got it on. So back we walked and caught, caught up to the party and somebody said, well, did you find it? And I said, oh yes, and that was that. Well, Mr. Griffiths on that trip apparently was prudent enough to take some duck for dinner. Listen, I remember uh, he shared it out with uh, several of the party and uh, it was a very welcome duck. I'm sure he's got quite enough to carry with his umbrella and the parcel holding the duck and then his, his parcel of clothes. Did you ever have any accidents crossing these rivers? None that I can speak of. The guide, Ferguson, asked me on one occasion when we were going to take a crowd to climb up first to see if it was safe. 
And if, if it was safe for me, if I got through without breaking my neck, then the others could follow. So my, my neck evidently wasn't of much value. So I, I was the scapegoat to try out. Once you get to the Duquesne range, of course, the trip's coming towards its end, isn't it? Yes. And it's getting easier because it's really practically all downhill until you come to Lake St. Clair, past Mount Byron and around there, and of course that's level, but rough going. If the party was small, the ranger would bring the boat up from uh, Cynthia Bay up and uh, take them down. But if the party was large, of course, it's too big for the boat, and they had to walk round the back of Mount Olympus. Two of some of the better known characters that the visitors used to meet as they went through these reserve areas. Well, it all depends on the date, but generally it was uh, well, Bob Quayle that took them out to uh, Waldham, and then there'd be Weindorfer, and then you'd walk through, and at the other end, the, you'd see this uh, Fergie, as we called him, who was the ranger at the uh, south end of Lake Sinclair. 